Good morning, good morning. John, can I ask you to uh, take a seat? Don't be un... Yeah. Yeah, come on, you know the script. <laughs> good morning, everybody. And well, first of all, welcome to West Lancashire College on an well, amazing morning. So uh, thank each and every one of you for coming. So, my name's Mark Whitworth, the chairman of, excuse me, the Scamersdale Place Board, and I guess the leader of the Scamersdale Ambassadors. If I may, I'd like to just take a minute or two just to sort of set the scene, really, um, and talk a bit about the background around you know, how we ended up here today and what we're trying to achieve. So the Place Board was formed around two years ago with a simple objective of devising a strategy and overseeing the implementation of that strategy, I guess, to raise the profile of Scammersdale and also stimulate economic activity. So that was sort of step one. Following that, we then uh, formed the Scammersdale Ambassadors, and, and that was intended to be a network of local business people, local stakeholders, people genuinely that can make a difference to the town. So again, I think most of that, uh, that story most of you would be aware of, but uh, I think what's really important is that those people, and those of you that are here today, people that can actually make things happen, and ultimately create, I guess, an environment for, for business and for growth. So back in January, I was... Uh, fortunate enough to, to be invited to chair the Scalesdale Place Board, which I'm delighted to do, and I have to say it's been sort of non-stop ever since. But at my first event, I made a commitment to each and every individual that was there, and that commitment was really, really simple, is that as ambassadors, as I see it, you're investors, okay? And I promise you personally that we will deliver a return on your investment of time and energy, and of course, your, your small contribution. Um, so real value, and real benefit, not just platitudes and words. Um, I mean, for me, days like today are great, absolutely fantastic, but they have to be more than a nice bacon butty, although I hope everyone got to enjoy one, yeah. More than just a network opportunity, although of course I see the, the value in that. They have to add value and aid your business. And if that's not the case, then perhaps we aid and help you in your personal development and your outlook. It's really important for me. So that is our promise to you, I give you my word, that while I'm around, we will press that, that, sort of, that whole focus and really, really, really try and deliver back value back to you. So I promise you, no, no, no pressure. So to this morning, I'm genuinely delighted and honoured to welcome Lord John Prescott. Now I'm, I must stop there because John's very clear this morning. Mark, it's John. So delighted to welcome John this morning. John has a wealth of, of knowledge and expertise, and not least in addressing some of the challenges we face here in Scalmersdale. His career CV is enviable. Um, so if I may just pick out one or two key points. As many of you, I'm sure, will know, he was the Deputy Prime Minister to Tony Blair. He was also a serving sort of First Secretary of State. Actually, other aspects to, to, to John's day job. He's a fellow of the Logistics Institute and a real close ally of the logistics and port industry. And I say what I'm about to with genuine conviction, better than any politician I know, and John's more than a politician, as you'll see and hear this morning, but better than any politician I know, John understands the importance of joining the dots. He really, really does. But you know, above all that, honestly, and I think it'll become really evident over the course of the next few minutes, he has a passion and an energy for the North, a real desire to see us fulfill our potential. So on that note, John, can I invite you up to the stage and uh, please tell us all about your vision and, and, and what you've achieved in Hull and how we can share some of that experience here. John, John Prescott, thank you. Thanks, Mark. This is my first visit to Skemmersdale, what you call Skem. So I ask around, don't I? I say, Skemmersdale. And I talked to one well-known professor that I know was a civil servant in my department once and says, well, they speak Scouse, but they're not Scouse. <laughs> so I expected most of you not to be wearing ties or ties, and I had to ask myself, do they wear ties in Scamsdale? We had a big debate about this. So I've been counting, you come in, I haven't got ties, and I have not. It's really coming into Scamsdale, knowing it's a new town, and I know the history of new towns. I think it's a bit of a mistake me and made at the moment. I'll come to that in a second or two. But when you come to the new towns and coming in here, I thought it would have the signs of urban decline. I couldn't get over seeing the grass, the green, the trees, the buildings, and then to walk in this wow building. And it's a wow building. 
This is what excites people about what is the nature and place. Because this is where you train your youngsters. And I'm talking today about 25 years. I'm not talking about a five-year program. So when you talk about place, let us talk about the framework in which you're going to make decisions. So I'm delighted to come here. And when Mark invited me to come here, we were working on a number of things, and he gave me one example. You know, if we're get, getting a change in the world and you want to take the goods to over to Homba, it takes you 15 hours on a train. And they designed a container because nobody would change the gauge. So we want to be in a big trading world. There's a lot of yak. I'm not going to talk about Bratix, leave that alone. But basically, it's the old railway gauge. You can't build a new industrial revolution that is now underway, which I'll explain why it's so fundamental. And yet you do it on our railway gauge. Nobody will be lower. You, know, you can't get the containers or the bridge, so you're designed to work on old. That is not the way to do it. That's what a college is about. And when I walked down the college today, and they said to me, that's engineering and, insure, uh, engineering and construction. You know, if we're going to do something, I'll talk about it today. The Industrial Revolution is a different one that's taking place, and I'll explain why. But you know, if you're to do something about reducing carbon, you hear a lot of talk about it, 8% don't eat your meat or something and all the problems they've got it and throw away your plastics. These are problems you're going to be dealing with, right? But when you came to that, now only 5% of our houses are new to new insulation standards. The real big problem of getting carbon reduced is to increase insulation in housing. Now, you've got here, we don't have bricklayers, we don't have joiners, we don't have the skills that have been here for years. But if you're looking where the chance for growth is, you're going to have to do something about houses. You need to get your youngsters trained in these places to actually meet that demand. So I'm not here to tell you what you do about SCAM. You'll know that, and that's why you're here. I will tell you how we did it in Hull, and that's what I want to say today. And that's what Mark said, working together as we are and trying to get a northern route right across over to Hull and that to do it in a decent time, not 10, 10 miles an hour if you can get the track. My background is I was 10 years a seaman, sailing out of Liverpool, of course, 40 years a Hull MP, Deputy Prime Minister, developed the whole Northern Way before they collapsed it for what they call Northern Powerhouse, something to say about that later. I'm an environment man, I negotiated the Kyoto, I'm a talker, so you'll be pleased to know I've got no slides. I'm not going to talk to you, right? And then at the same time, therefore, how we do it. But I'm bound to say I've done a lot of things, got a lot of experience, very fortunate in life. But when I die, and I mean 60 years, it won't be very far away, I'm sure. I keep telling me why. She gets a bit uptight about it. And when I die, you know, they'll play about me after 50 years in politics, doing lots of good things nationally and internationally. All they'll show is me thumping that bloody fella in Wales. <laughs> My life will be 10 seconds thumping some pig farmer in Wales. But that's the nature. But I have learned a lot, and I want to try and give you my experience as I see it, right, into this situation. And my experience is one of Hull. Now, I only went to Hull in 64, so I've just only just got the visa papers, you know, because they're very proud about being Hull, you know. It's those with the passion of the converted like me that have got a view about it. But there are similarities. It's true, your population, I think, is about 28,000 or something, when I looked at one of the figures. We're 280,000, so we are 10 times bigger. So we might get certain advantages. We know the problems of big cities, drawing all our people, and more concern to feed the work instead of the workers to work, change it around and take it to, uh, to the workers. Now, in those circumstances, that's one of our problems that we have at the moment. So in Hull, whilst we're in a bigger city, we did the face the problem. You know, people go, oh, whoever wants to come to Hull, I've got a feeling they say that here, don't they? I've got a picking of some of the things. They're not too proud of what they've gone. They've gone through a certain industrial decline, and they know that they've got to make some changes, but they're not sure what they should do. And they moan that, you know, in Hull they moan that we got bombed during the war and nobody gave us any publicity for it. You know, that's a big thing in Hull, thinking about Hull. Coventry got bombed as well, but they got all the publicity, they didn't give it to Hull. So that was another mark against the people in Hull. And it downs them, and it's critical to get that right. We're outside the big city areas, like you are. You know, you've got the Manchester, Liverpool, and that's what they did with new towns, and you were a new town. So, really, they were building a place to live, but not necessarily to work. So you had to get on the train and go to Manchester or Liverpool. We've got the same with Newcastle or Leeds. The big towns get it. 
Why? Because it's a big city policy. And many places which aren't big cities like you and like Hull, or a little bigger than you, basically had to fight for their share of the resources, the proper infrastructure, the workplace, all those. So we do share a similar. Tradition in Hull, the industries affected, was fishing basically on ports, and that's still been the case. We've lost fishing altogether. You had coal and other industries. They were the actual results of an old industrial revolution that we worked right through, and many cases left it. But what we did is we had limited infrastructure. I was going to catch a train back to London. I said, where's the station? They said, oh, it's in Wigan. Um, you ain't got a station now. I thought, man, I got a cheer on that. What, believe that on the side, you know. Um, so these things, but you are a maritime area, like we're a maritime area. We have a big port with the gateways to trade, so there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to share in that development. You did in the last revolution. I want to talk about this new one. So we've now got the Northern Powerhouse. I'm not going about the Northern Powerhouse. And first of all, it doesn't call the North. It stops on the Pennines. Secondly, it hasn't got the powers and resources it needs to do it and make its own decisions. Even your big transport plan that talks about things at the moment says, made in the North, issued in the North, for the North, decided by London and Grayling. Well, God help you, you're not going to get much of your station off him. We can't even keep in our trains and railway lines under Grayling, but leaving that, and now we started on the shipping industry. So there is a real problem about central government and having some accountability yourself in the area. I'm not going to open up the regional arguments. I've given the uh, Northern Way, which I brought in in government. That had power, it had resources. No, they scrap it and they bring in powerhouse. Now, I'm not going to, we've got powerhouse at the moment till the buggers go. Basically, so in the powerhouse is largely, to my mind, not Northern. And it's not devolution, because it has to be decided by transport. When I was involved in bringing the Northern Way and Scotland in and Wales, we gave powers to Scotland and Wales. I couldn't get, quite get them for the Northern, so we ended up with cities. And if you're a big city, you're all right. But if you're somewhere like Skemmersdale or even Hull Town, you're on the outside. You don't take part in the decision. You're not part of that decision. So these are some of the fundamental flaws, I think, in the situation at the moment. So that is very similar, basically, um, to, to Hull. We share the same problem. So why, why tell you about the whole problems? I think I want to come bring it home to you that it's bigger than Skemmersdale just making decisions. You can't just do it on your own. But you've got to show the way and believe what you believe and what you want. I think you call it a place or a plan and you're all getting together now, that's welcome. But you need to have one common message by everybody saying it, decided by everybody. And we had bondholders from Young Business come together. You call them ambassadors, hello ambassadors. It means that you, it's quite critical. And you know in the past, as I'm sure you're aware, on the local authorities, we get problems of all these bodies that should make decisions. We've got a university. Thank God you haven't got one in that sense. We have a university which thinks town and gown is having a sherry at the VC's house at the autumn time, you know, when they should be using that brain power, that intelligence, giving us ideas and alternatives. And that's why the colleges can play that role as well. So I'm delighted to be and really pleased to see such a college because here's the core. You're not build what you want or achieve what you want. If I'm talking, don't talk five years, talk 20 years. In Byron, we talk to 2050. You've got to be planning for that, right? I see that construction there. I tell you what, once we get round to doing something about housing, because if you set a target to cut carbon by 80%, you better do something about housing. You better start insulating them. And then if you do that, you haven't got them. You've got a place here. You need to be training for what's going to come about to meet a carbon requirement. It's an environment requirement. That is the essential thing that we picked up in Hull. How can we make our Hull meeting to the new industrial re uh, revolution? It's not based on coal and oil anymore. Your estuary in the Mersey was based, you can see them, all the refineries, it's based on oil, the coal that is on the ground. Now it's based on wind, renewable energy. That's what's coming about. Why? Not only because it's cheaper, and yes, it is cheaper, but also because it's a part to reduce carbon. It's carbon free. That's what we've got to be doing. So if we're living in an economy that's going to be governed by carbon considerations, how do we do to help to reduce carbon? 
And in whole, we fastened on to that. And what we thought was important, of course, to make this radical change was to get some renewable energy. So we got Siemens to come in. We managed to convince them to locate on the estuary and in our ports. We had another one from Denmark, Ursa, have come in as well. So we're now one of the biggest actual wind-producing areas in Britain, and it will grow. You've got it here in the northwest as well, off your coast. The important thing, which I'll come to talk to you about estuary, you've got a Mersey estuary, we've got a Humber estuary. One of the great things of why gas has gone down so uh, the, the production of the wind power has gone down is because we've got a continental shelf. You've got a continental shelf. When we drilled for oil back in the north, up in the north there, it was very deep water. Now with the continental shelf, we get bigger pounds, ones that you can't just put on the shore, right? So getting access to the sea and a continental shelf act is the new energy in the new industrial revolution. You've got it over here. We've got quite a lot of it on the East Coast, right? So we're saying that's going to be the future. Not just building pylons and putting up and turbines. It's the industries that begin to support them. It's the start. You know, I've just done a program about canals and I've been looking at the canals. And, you know, I, I saw a windmill there to just crush the corn. This is about 150 years ago. I see another one to crush the ore, to put into the uh, crockery and all that that's going on. I keep forgetting his name, but you know, up in Stoke. And uh, basically, it's wind and power again and wind and water. They're the new energy sources. They were at the beginning of industrial. They went to canals, they went to railways, they, the logistics, the thing. It's now a whole new, and I'm arguing, an estuarial base. Now you and I have common in that. Uh, you might not be sitting on the shoreline, but yours an estuary. It's dealing with new energy, and you've got to be asking, what can Skemmersdale do, actually, to begin to build into that new industrial revolution? And governments are forced now. So when they're asking you to do things now, they're going to be asking... How much can you cut carbon by? Because we've made it a big thing of cutting by 80%. It's a hell of a target. And that's come about why. Not because we've been convinced in it. I negotiated the Kyoto Agreement. Well, we came in in 1997. Um, Gore, um, um, Clinton, because I worked with Gore, Clinton rung up and said to Blair, he said, have you got anybody to get, that can handle the um, negotiations at Kyoto? It's got to be tough. It's getting difficult. He said, I've only got this fellow who was a trade union leader. And uh, he's a trade union negotiator. And I think my first fight was against the Labour government in 1966. But I'll leave that aside. That was in Liverpool, where they fight against everything in Liverpool, don't they? So to that extent, what is now beginning to happen is that you had Kyoto, which you've heard a lot about. That was it, because this is a global problem, by the way. I had to fight against the science. Everybody saying didn't believe the science, Americans and everybody. So we got a global solution required you to have targets for all countries. We just did it for industrial countries. I couldn't get Australia on board. Do you know why? Well, the Prime Minister told me because the problem is the sheep are always farting. Well, I mean, that is methane. That is the gases, right? The basket of gases. But they didn't join. But I managed, and the Americans tried to pull out, and I managed to get the Russians on board. But that's international negotiations, right? Now... We've now gone to Paris, and you heard about Paris, and what they said there is you must have a national target to cut. And we've now got moving to regionals, which we're developing on the Humber, on estuarial development. You know, certain industries need to be near estuaries. They are low carbon, and you need to exploit, in this case, the estuary. So we've decided to say, how do we get the best use out of the estuary? Now, that's a common factor between us, right? You've got Maritime Base, you've got the logistics, and the other thing that's beginning to change is not only the target that's coming about, right, and all the targets they're now saying electric cars don't eat meat and all that, they are things you've got to consider. That will be the debate. How do you play a part in that change? It's a new kind of industrial revolution that's underway. Now, it's only that industrial. The global trend is changing, and that's advantageous to us here in the north because what has happened now, when I negotiated the first agreement, there were 44 countries, right? And uh, so we got an agreement for industrial countries, right? Then, when we got to Paris, there's 196. Now, two-thirds of them are developing countries. They're not in the same position we are. But they are going to change trade. Why? Because most of your goods you're going to be buying are from China, are from India. All these countries are now developing their industrial capacity. That means where we were the workshop of the world, 
they're becoming the workshop of the world. There'll still be a margin for us, you know. Dyson will go to Hong Kong, call it British, we'll leave it alone anyway. So if you look at those circumstances, it means then, where does all those goods that they produce go? Because any country developing needs to have exports, needs to create the wealth to be making a low carbon, to be a low carbon economy. If they do that, where do they want to sell it? You know where the biggest consumer market, even in America, is Europe. And Europe and basically there, they want to get there to sell their consumer goods. That's where they come in. I mean, the Americans having go to the Chinese, they produce it in China and send it back and then blame them for causing the carbon. But that's typical Trump stuff, isn't it? So if you look at now the situation, uh, uh, that means it's got to come. Where does it come? It has to come across the northern route. It was a trade route in the old Industrial Revolution, but we were the workshop of the world. I'm sorry, it's moved on now. We might be leaders in technology and new environmental, that's a challenge for us. But they want to get to the market. So the global change is coming across our northern route. And if you want a good example of it, 95% of the goods in Britain now going to Europe go down to Dover. Christ, they can't find a car park for them or even a ship to get on, you know, at the moment. So what you will, why is 95% of the goods from Ireland, Scotland going right down to Dover? Why didn't you come over to Hull? If you, and it's not only just, well, I'm only one and a half hours on the ferry and the hull, it's going to be overnight. We'll change some of the ferry times. But also, when you're do, doing that, you've got to recognise that it's shoving out carbon. All that carbon now on that route. If the carbon becomes an economic and a political consideration, as it's going to do, it makes sense to divert them to Europe further up, not going all the way down to the biggest congested area in London. So, in a way, these are decisions that are going to come about. And my point in saying this to you is, I want to say to you, there is a new industrial revolution underway. It's not just a modernising of the old. It's a fundamental change coming. Because carbon and environment cost in health and everything else, and in our planet, as it is at the moment, you've got to make a change. And it's in crucial we do that. Now, I hear that people say, well, Britain's only 1% of it, you know, compared to the rest. That's true enough. But you need to develop this new type of economic low-carbon economy, which will be used for these developing countries, because we don't want to go through them poisoning like we did by pumping out the high carbon. So that I want to impress on you, the timetable there is not the five years that governments tend to think of, except when it comes to environment, because now we've set targets for 20, 2050, right? 80% cut. To achieve that, how do you in Skemmersdale, how do we in Hull play a part to get ahead in this new industrial change that's taking place? Which really, when you look at the barges I was on, and you look at, uh, oh, I'll give you a test there. What's that fellow? <laughs> I keep forgetting his name. The one that did all the crockery. Wedge, and you know, I can never pretty get it. I knew if I go to a woman, I'd get a straight answer. Anyway. So Wedgwood, what did he do? I mean, it's marvellous when you look at it. Those engineers that build those canals, we talk about HS2, God for sake. Just look what the engineers did in that rubble. But why? He looked at it, it was in Stoke. Here was Liverpool, here was Hull. He stuck a little cali uh, uh, connection onto the canal. And then he gets to Liverpool for that war trade and he gets the hole to go to the other trade. It, one connection. It would not have been an industrial revolution without the logistics, about the horse cart, about the canal, about the train. So we need to look at those logistics. And I'm saying to you, you're in the area. It's a type of industry, and Peel's industry is classic, really. It's an area where we have to get the logistics right. We can start on that now. Now, the transport plan they've given is more about uh, growth and jobs than it is about the environmental considerations. And that northern transport, the produce transport strategy, it'll be broken down because you can't spend that out of money. Mind you, I won't go into the uh, HS1, HS2, because I, I don't think that'll go, but they are, it's another matter. Um, so, in that sense, if I look now at that change, Peel's an example. They get the Panama, Panama, Panama Canal widened, you build a place then to take bigger containers, and we go and give them the old railway gauge of the last industrial revolution. What do you think they're going to think in Panama, whether they're going to come over our northern route? It's nonsense. We have to think ahead. They widened that at great cost. We could benefit because we are the highway to Europe, the biggest consumer market. So we've got you, you're in an area where logistics is going to play a greater part in it, right? 
and we are the gateway, if you like, and I argued that estuaries can be important as this, because estuaries, um, the Mersey was very much with oil in the other, uh, and coal, now it's on wind and air and rivers, and rivers are important estuaries because they take you out to the, I'm defended, love her. Bye, love. I have. <laughs> so if you take the estuaries, what the estuaries do, they take you out to sea. The low continental shelf is the reason now we have the lowest energy costs of any of the energy resources, even nuclear. They're going to have to start thinking about nuclear now, whatever its carbon content, but it's costing you three times as much as you're likely to be getting out the North Sea. And we say to ourselves, right, that's the new energy source, what can we do? So we get Mersey, uh, the Siemens have come in, which is a big thing. You start in here about the new energy. Renewable energy, whether it's solar or wind, uh, is the new kind of energy for the new revolution. But it's not just the source, it's the supply industry. If you look at the old industrial relationship, it's the other industry that came up and to support it. And there's a massive amount in the supply industry side. You should be looking at how can you make a contribution to that, right? And so that is one of the, uh, the estuaries that are important, and I'm developing that internationally as a way that I actually do it. Now, of course, what you want for the new industry, you need land, you need space, you need new industries, you need skills. They're the essential parts of developing this new industrial revolution, based, in a way, I say, on that kind of thing. And on the industries come from, if you look at Siemens, they came in to do energy, they're building trains in Doncaster, all of, in Goole. They're now beginning to say, well, why don't we do manager? They bring in skills, they are buying new ideas, and we're beginning to see the supply industry side that comes from it. We've got a, a refinery in Hull that tells us, John, we produce coke here, and it goes to China, who then mix it up with something else and put it into all our telephones and the technology. He said, why aren't we doing it here? We've got the land, why can't we make the mix instead of it send it to China? Recycling is another important thing, if you like. And we've got a big plant there, cost 100 million now. Instead of dumping it in the ground, why aren't we actually probably putting it into facilities for recycling and do it by barge? Barge is a warehouse, shove them down to the side of the banks. We have a big island where we dig the ground and poison it. So we've got to start, and we've got canals. I've just seen them today. One run past your house, didn't it, Mark? Anyway, they reminded me over the Pennines. Because when you think in the Pennines and industry, what is it in logistics? They want you to get there for half a nine in the morning, don't they? Because it's just in time. But a barge is a warehouse. It doesn't matter how long it takes, as long as you're there on Tuesday at nine o'clock in the morning. So this connection between Leeds, which the years ago they built a canal for on narrow bar, we should start looking at some of these old industrial assets that could play a part. Don't see them as worn out. Classics now is canals. They are slowly beginning to use, but they're a great leisure facility. So to that extent, we need to ask what you've got that can be dealt with and dealt with in that way. So, but what you need is partnership. People think, well, I was all for state industry and do I went through my phase on that, you know. But I notice now, when you're looking at the development when we're in government, you do need a partnership about it. The universities tend to think it's really about having a sherry with the local authority um, at the autumn called Town and Gown. But there they've got the brains. What the hell are you doing with them? Why are you not thinking ahead? You've got time to sit on your bloody seat and, and think of a plan. So we've got universities now producing its logistics plan, working with people. How do we get things more effective over our to move our traffic between getting the global route that I'm talking about? The local authorities often had the problems and business used to complain, they had it in Hull, about the authorities argue about authorities, but don't really get enough to bring in business sections into it. And that happened in all. You call them ambassadors here. We call them actually bondholders. They call themselves. A lot of young people come together, said, why can't we play a part in developing? So when I see ambassadors, I see bondholders. But what they do something else, industry come in. And I have to say, Mark, you've come here from Peel. And I've got to say what happened in Hull. Ergen, who is now Big Stevens chairman, and I said, why aren't you doing something for the Northeast? You're doing it all for the Northwest. And he said, John, I've been to your local enterprise board, which aren't so great, you know what I mean? But basically, instead of regional development agencies, and what he did there 
was got them all together. But he said, I went to the local enterprise board. There was a big fight about something on the local council agenda, not about the development. And you've got the same problems in a way. You're starting to do to say, perhaps the sum of the total of the whole can be green, uh, greater than the sum of the individual parts. That's, that's critical. And therefore, how you get this together, how you do your place, I see the signs you're doing that. It's called place, I tend to call a plan. I mean, that's been interesting now. I've been on in politics all this time, and planning and intervention has always been an ideological difference. No, now governments now come along, so we want to plan, we want to do this. Whether they do it's another matter, but that is in the air. So when you're planning something, you need to be getting into it. Hull doesn't sit on the transport board. They invite us in, but we're not part of it making a decision about the strategic railway that goes across the north. That's nonsense. And then you produce a plan that's everybody's plans and nobody can afford it. So in a way, you've got to be saying, it might be about station and mountain by the road. We've got a motorway called the M62. It stops 16 miles short of all. And you go down onto another two thing. All the lorries are pouring through there. We need a new communication that could be on the river, which we're doing. So you sit down and work out those problems, really. So I say, just look at the old industry. What can you do with them in this new? Well, our ports are still trade, but we've lost our coal. Now we're supplying the engines and the power units and the fishing industry is now providing the supply boats for it, having died as a fishing industry. So those old parts begin to play a, uh, a part in it and they begin to develop skills, different kind of skill mix which is important. So in a way, Drax, you might have heard of Drax, here's Peel sending all the, it gets pushed out of coal, could have an argument about that, but he was pushed out of coal. It, and then gets timber modules, which you buy them, he gets them over there and the timber modules, then they go in an old fashioned train, which is a new container one, because we've got old gauges, right? And it takes 14 hours to get to the Humber. You can't build a global route like that. That's just bloody nonsense. And yet we produce a transport plan that's about, can you get 20 minutes to get to Manchester? You'll say 20 minutes to, uh, going to Manchester. Well, you know, I don't know whether you, but I work a lot on trains. The idea that 20 minutes again, what is important, that are cattle trucks from bloody Leeds over to Manchester, we've got so many people travelling on them that are a disgrace. You wouldn't put cattle in them now. If you go on Leeds, get a train, two carts things, right? So we get more investment, fine. But what it's based upon, everyone tells you whether they get there five minutes earlier, 20 minutes more, right? All you're doing is moving people from one area into another or into another town, from one town into another. It's what they called in the new town policy. They didn't build the industry in it. You just got that you didn't even get the station, I agree. But, but anyway, but what they do get is a um, movement between. That is connectivity. That isn't the essential thing. What is essential is getting a freight route that meets up to international standards. So we become the kind of causeway from workhouse to consumer and we're in the middle of it and we develop that. Then you must ask if I'm near to that, how do you fit into that? When the government wants to change housing to reduce carbon, as it'll have to do 90% of these old houses, you've got the construction facilities here to provide the skills by planning now for something that's probably 10 years away, but has to be done before 2050. So these old industrial assets, I mean, I don't know where, were, I don't think there's a pit here, was there? But there's pits in the areas. Yeah, well, if you look at the pits, I'm now working a professor, I'm going to Malaysia in a couple of weeks time to expand this idea. And I said, I was at a closed down pit on this bargain train, and I said to the man who had the museum, I said, do you want to come a farm worker? What do you mean? I said, the pit, there was the empty shaft. What they're now planning is how you build, uh, do the energy in a shaft. You put a big conveyor belt in, all the actual fruit and trees or whatever you want, it grows at 15 times faster because you put the light in and the water in, right? Now, it goes on a conveyor, you take it off and you're selling in the local food markets, basically, food, which we at the moment import. And basically, so it's a pit shaft that stays there. It's too expensive to fill in. Why don't we look what these assets can do and help, even if it's a small contribution to reducing the carbon? You need to dress it up in the carbon argument because people wouldn't normally think of that. And there are many other ideas involved in that. The canals are in again. I think I'm looking at that very much more, what we can do with the canals. But to that extent, North Sea. Look how we change North Sea gas. You had all your cookers, didn't you? Every one was done to get, take North. That's a big operation, right? 
What has it left? Empty, empty holes in the sea. Pipes that go to the towns. Well, what we're saying is, put the gas you want to do on carbon gas. Once you've got it, how do you, what do you do with it? You've got to dump it somewhere, and it's got to be safe. So we're saying, why don't you use the pipes to pump it back to the holes in the North Sea? And you have another industry in conservation on carbon. So there are lots of ideas you can put together thinking about the old industrial, and that's what we've been doing. I thought, to that extent, that, that's some of the things that we're doing. An airport, an old Hessel Airport, now has become a major energy centre. Why? Because they want to be near, in this modern industry, to near cheaper energy, whether it's gas or whether it's carbon. Look at the assets you've got that you ignore, and that's the challenge, and you put that into a plan. Now, I think the most important asset, without a doubt, is the community. If the community's got no faith in itself, or like oh, in whole saying, well, oh dear, nobody comes here, you know, so it began to change. And you might say why it began to change. And I mean, they got caught up with sporting all. The most exciting thing is where the whole KR beat the blooming other whole team, you know. They're not doing very well in the league. It doesn't matter because they got bragging rights once a year. And you see the whole centre lift up because it feels its team's won. Now, you probably have a bit of that as well. How do you get the community spirit to feel much by, uh, about it? And that extent, what we've done. Of course, Andy um, Burnham, when he was culture minister, brought in culture year. Now, you had it in Liverpool, but you used the Beatles, didn't you? That was a European one. What we did, we do it Hull. And in Hull, we uh, got the uh, culture train. It turned the city around. It turned it around. People were coming to Hull and to see things going on. And we've now got people in the street walking around with a map. They're called tourists. Tourists never came to Hull. They've come now because they've heard so much about it. Where it is, I must go and see it. So as a way, the community plays a big part in that. So then we went from there to Maritime City, right? That which we're now developing, right? And you know, last, uh, two weeks ago, we did something else that the, the community loved, basically, was it said, we got Siemens to pay the schools to build these little racing cars. It's called Formula 24. There is a Formula 21, about 24. The local authority just got the laws now closed off the streets. You couldn't do that before. The council wanted, but couldn't do it. They've changed it. So we had a formula race of kids about 10 or 11 or 14 actually racing cars with the businessmen that provided Siemens and that, right? And they had a formula race. And you're saying, well, this is marvelous. What was the win? It, the win was not about how fast you did it. It's how many miles you've got to have a 212 volt battery. And you built then the science kid places for kids to go and see how science works. You've got those youngsters beginning to think of energy, of efficiency, of technology. And you excite them about so we've almost given up on engineering. If you look at the engineering of the canals, we're, they were fabulous. Now, they probably come from Poland. I'm not an anti thing, you know, but a lot of things come in. Lorry drivers, we have to take them from Poland. We don't even train lorry drivers, right? So to that extent, we got the excitement of the community to, to feel this is whole. And the big title, we are whole. And eventually we put a big one of those props in the centre of the street and everybody came to see it. They began to be, you see the mood changed in Hull. And it's because you do more of that and make him feel. And we'd had, we had volunteers. Do you know there are 4,000 volunteers dressed in blue, just part-time people that just want, don't get paid. They just felt to welcome people when they come at the station. I know you ain't got a station. And they arrive at the station, they welcome as they come in, right? And they're actually, people feel very proud of that. And that's what they do. And they got something to do I never would have thought. I don't know if you heard it. 4,000 of them went naked and got filmed naked. Did you see that? And this photographer painted them all blue. And it made it look like the sea. So they're all five o'clock in the morning, laid out in the street, bollock naked. If you can use that word, but anyway. But uh, all naked. And now when I was shaking hands with any of these people, I could see if there was any blue paint on the nails, you know. But what they did it, they did it in a community spirit. It's just an indication. You've got to get the community behind it. And that means the universities, the colleges, the business, the local authority, the developers, all those. Now, I see in what you've been doing symbols of those things. And I think this meeting's like that. So if I can leave you with a message about it, is at the end, these parts can make you successful, but the pride of the community is quite an important part. What you call a place is a plan produced by your Schemersdale thing, picks out what its priorities are, then goes for them. And by the way, one thing that's very important, a lot of the research we did was money that came from the government. 
or from industry because there are all these funds available if you know what you want. If you want to say how we're going to do about training, why we're going to be doing about what kind of industry or carbon, we've just bid for a 50 million fund to make it the place of growth. The government said industrial strategy should be a place of growth. We say, right, make the estuary that. And today, and yesterday in the paper, we got 50 million to do what? Because of the floods we we're all concerned about, we build a national flood centre to train firemen how to operate in floods. We're going to hit lots of floods, that's still part of the climate. So in many ways, we've looked at different things. And all I can encourage you to say is that the whole approach was to sit down, work with everybody, put in a plan, decide priorities. That's always difficult, right? Decide the priority you want. But be clear about what you want. That's what's quite important. And so my point is, if the community begins to think, the sum of the whole is greater than the parts. Everybody stays in the parts. That's the way we were. Now it's a bigger picture. It's a different industrial revolution. And I would say to you and encourage you, get and look what is Schema's contribution to this new industrial re revolution. Come. But at the end of the day, you need the people. So involve them all in it. The integration way of making decisions is quite critical about that. So I hope in a way I've given some indication we are proud of what we've done in Hull. We've still got our problems. I pick up the television, it's going to Skillthorpe, which is on the estuary. Look as if they're now going to close it. The government has a role in all these things, and you've got to be sure of that. They say plan and integrate. You plan, tell them what you're wanting from it, but make it clear. So I would say to you, I think you've got a place committee, haven't you? I invite them to come to Hull. And we'll explain to you why and what the connections were if you want more details about it. Bring the place committee and we'll do that. And then we can actually talk about what I've talked about tonight and what different interpretations on it. But I would wish you well, particularly here, and a new town become a new town. Be it Skem, it's a beautiful place. I'll tell people, don't tell me about Skem. It's beautiful. I know Skem. I'm an adopted ambassador and I will be for the next. Thanks very much. John, can I uh, just ask you, to, <coughs> excuse me, what we'd like to do if we could is, is take any questions there may be from the audience. We've got one or two that have been uh, provided to us uh, earlier, but uh, any questions from the room? Taxi. <laughs> <laughs> of, of course, please. John, you've been out of politics, but, uh, I'm politics. Uh, you've been out of politics Thank God. for uh, some time now. And I just wonder what you see. Um, from my perspective as a business leader, I think I can probably speak for most people in the room, when I think we see more quality leadership in our teams in our own businesses than we do in national government. And uh, I think what's, got, what's happened with Brexit uh, seems to be an indication of that lacking of, of leadership. And it's not just a party political, it's right across all the parties. We just don't seem to see that. I just wondered what your take on that was from your perspective. Uh, first of all, I'm certainly not out of politics. I'm out of what you said. And by God, watching them in Parliament, I'm quite glad I am in a way. But it's sad because Parliament is not performing what its job is to do, is to hear the views then find a solution. And I would say I, I'm still working 18 hours a day because you like the job. That's always the problem, isn't it? You work a lot if you like it. But I'm in the Council of Europe. I'm in the negotiations at Kyoto, at Paris. I kept all that going. And the only way I could do that was being in a parliamentary assembly. And that was the Lords in that sense. So that's why I encouraged me to take that way. And, and, so, and I'm still developing the estuarial development. Nobody's come up with that. I'm using estuarial development as the next stage of a new industrial revolution based on carbon, low carbon economies. Because estuaries are all over the world and in these countries. So we are designing a new model. So I do that more internationally. You know, I'm very pleased to be able to do it. I despair what I see is happening in Parliament. And in a way, I put it down this perhaps unfairly, but it's just the way I see it, listening to all the debates that are in the parliamentary party, if I just my own party. But similar things are happening in theirs. When I came into Parliament, I, I was a seaman for 10 years in lots of strikes and in this Merseyside thing, right? You learnt in the trade unions that even if you disagreed, you, found, you knew who the boss was, you knew the one you were trying to deal with, you got together, you found a compromise, and then you got on with putting the case. That meant now, certainly in the Labour Party, there were people then like me, uh, who was a seaman for 10 years, so I have the experience of being knocked about there and making judgments. 
My flatmate was Dennis Skinner, who was a coal, mi coal miner. Now, we did have lots of people from that background. Now they're all sons of bus fares, sons of miners, sons of seamen, so they've all been to university. Now, you can't change that people, one of the advantages of well, wanting more of our youngsters to go to university, you get the university experience. But unfortunately, it means you then become an assistant to an MP and then you become an MP. You're denied what I think is the central part of that, which is playing a part, uh, is actually coming to an agreement. So what we've got is a load of students in the main we're still finding student debates. That's all you are getting now. And everybody's firm of what they don't want to do, but not very positive about it. So in a way, we're full of intelligence and little, less, and little bloody common sense, which is where you find agreements. Now, that's just my interpretation of it, but I know this. The days of the trade union sons like me coming through are gone. Trade unions don't want them anywhere. They've all changed. It's all now university. And universities can play a part. But what it can't in politics, it still keeps to its kind of own ideological what they did students. I'm not in the communists, I'm not in the so-and-so and so. And I think that parliament is going to be. I don't think we'll go back to the old style tribal politics they talked about where I, where I come from. It's changed, but it's changed in Europe. It's now more the elitist, professional people. And because of the kind of squabbles, business don't want to come involved, or they're still identified with it. I think that's sad, but it's real life. And Brexit is the big challenge. Are you going to be finding a way? I must say, I fought against the first referendum in 1975. I didn't want a big, powerful Europe playing a part and wanting to become a superpower. I was against it. I was offered the commissioner's job by Callaghan, but I didn't want it because it runs on a constitution. You could call it a capitalist one if you want, but anyway, I didn't want to be involved in it. And so basically, uh, the Europe one now, uh, I changed. Why did I change? Because when I negotiated the Kyoto Agreement, it was big powers who decided themselves what they were going to do. So the powers in a new world are China, America, India, uh, all those, right? They're now making the big collective international decisions, right? And I just think being British, waving a flag on the line and saying, please take notice of us, it's not dealing with global problems, which global solutions. And so I have switched. I did vote to remain in it. It's got problems. I don't like a lot of the things. But you better get yourself into a continental part because look at Russia. Uh, Americans coming over now. If you don't do that, we're going to take away your thing. Mm. We'll not do this. My God, under Bush. Under, mind you, Bush was bad enough. But in Bush, well, he won't move the, in Kyoto that he didn't believe the science. So I had to move, we'll get out and then don't go. We're not going to have the Americans tell us what to do. But I did have to negotiate with Russia to make sure I got the balance on the percentages. So the global world's changing. And we've got to get used to that. And the trouble is, I think sometimes it's a bit of a generation. It's no coincidence that many of the younger people want to stay in Europe. The elderly people think we won the war, some of them. You know, it wasn't the Yanks or the, uh, or the, uh, Yanks or the Russians that played a part. And I think that's sad. And we're opting out of a global world that needs global solutions, and waving the Union Jack's not going to give a solution, but that's just my view. It's one of those, John, I think, um, I, there can't be an individual in this room that isn't frustrated with the current situation, but uh, thank you for the question. I, I think um, it's a very difficult one to answer. Jo John, if I may, there's, there's one, uh, we'll come to the room again in a second. Um, but actually, one of our... I guess key asks as, as a town, I and mean, we've got great attributes. John, you've, you've articulated them incredibly well this morning. One of the key sort of links that we're missing, of course, is, is rail connectivity. Now, there's a real, there's an outline plan, there's a drive towards it, but I think we all recognise it's, uh, it's some time off. What can people in this room do? What, what would you advise people in this room to do to get behind and actually make our voice heard? What, you know, how can we come together and bang that drum and, and make some influence over, I guess, trying to get it pulled forward? Well, get a framework where you've got some say in it. It's not the way at the moment. It's almost being decided by big cities. Or, and it's not regional. It stops on the Pennines. Even local authorities are limited to what role they can have. But if I give you a good example when you talk about rail, they've just produced a, a transport policy, uh, Transport North, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, I, I've been talking to their people about it because I wasn't happy about it. When you look at it, they have calculated a plan 
Were you involved in that one that went on then at Chester where they all sat down and said, this is wonderful? Look, are you having a go at me again? Well, yeah, you I were. I'm there. glad you yeah. admitted yeah. that. I didn't want to say that. But <laughs> they all went to, and they were given a plan. It's all right having a plan, or you call it a place. It better be a realistic one. Yeah. What this plan is, it's gone to the railway people, it's gone to the local authorities, it's gone to business, and they've all got their little bit in it. So you know what happens? You get a bill for 50 billion. You're never going to get 50 billion, whatever happens. So if you want to be strategic, you're going to have to pick the ones that are important. At the moment, it's based on connectivity. Yeah. That isn't the most, we do need strategic rail going right across, whether it's freight or passenger. And we spent some time talking about that uh, last night. Now, it means you've got to change some of that priority. I'm personally now beginning to canvas to say, you're not going to get the money. You could get it if you consult HS2, and HS2 won't get it anyway. That's a bit of a fraud on money, but leaving that aside, I had to rescue, by the way, HS1 when I first came in. It collapsed, they want two billion more, and it was run by a man called Mr. Hornby. I mean, you can't make it up for him. <laughs> but anyway, we didn't give it him, but we, we saved it, right? Now, HS2 has got that challenge strategic now. We're back to your railway station and railway connections. It's as important to be freight as passenger. Now, the trouble is, many people then say, ah, but... It's expensive when you do freight because you've got to lower the tunnels or do the things, or even build containers that can just go through the old gauge. That is not the answer. Now, if you can't get 40, somebody's going to have to meet, whether they meet in Chester, and say, which are the ones? Because everybody's thrown but the catch in sinking. Every local authority's got every bit he wants, that's right, or she wants, right? So to that extent, it's being decided in a popular way, but it's not a plan because eventually somebody will come along and say, well, the Chancellor, the next Chancellor's promised to make the money. It won't be there. I doubt they'll cancel HS2 and say concentrated in the north. But money's the critical part, and that's why on the railway side of it, we're lucky to have a railway. Um, it could be a lot better. But we've got to now argue for a strategic framework, which means freight is as important for us in the north. So whether you've got your bid in for the station, I don't know whether the bid for the station's in, you might have to say it's far better to get a strategic route across the north, whether it's passenger or whether it's uh, freight, and then fit the others as they go along. But from yours, you need to be, for you, I would say, opening up the northern route will benefit along the north, uh, basically, because it's logistics, it's port to port, it's strategic, and it's the two gateways to the big world going on. You have to have that in your mind when you make your own priorities. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you. So, open up the questions to the room again. Ian, if I may, please. This is all about businesses coming together to try and help deliver things to the local area to make sure this local area is recognised for what it can uh, deliver in its own right. How, have you got some examples of where businesses working together cohesively in an area has actually helped deliver things that you wouldn't have normally have delivered? Well, I think if you take a different perspective of what you're doing for an area, what I've tried to say about Hull, we know what the basic, we make a judgment about what this new industrial coming about. And when as the local authorities have to have a portion in planning where the land's likely to be, right? Often is the case when business meet with local authorities, they just want that one business interest. They haven't come in for the strategic reason. But they've got to recognize it is a strategic reason and you have to judge that project against that. Now, in hot, if you look at the uh, energy, we go uh, for uh, Siemens and others. It's the industries that follow that that become critical. And the people who can speak that most can see it are largely businesses because their business is looking for business opportunity. That's their job to do it, right? So they need to feed into that. And let me give you an example. If I look what the wind industry has now done, it just produced a plan for the government under its industrial strategy. It's very good. What is it doing? It's motivated by getting greater access out to sea to get lower energy costs because that's where it is. It's not on the land. It's out on the continental shelf. But when they produced it, they didn't take account of, say, what do we have to do to turn our air into low carbon and what are the advantages we've got? They look at the main argument on environment. They talk about environment. They talk about saying, right, if you've got the environment, we can get you cheaper costs if we can build more turbines. Fine. And you get a cheaper cost. But they're not looking at what orally, though to be fair to them, 
They have now just agreed in a project together we've sent to government, a research centre build, being built on a complete research centre in Hull to do the future research visit carbon and the consequences that come from our access to an energy. Now, that means that's the university working on the centre, that's the local authorities, it's business, and they're beginning to look at what do we get from the science industries? Because once you've got your energy, people will flow if you've got the lower energy and come in. You need the land for it. But secondly, you need to be asking yourself, what's the future? Is it battery storage? Is it the kind of technological changes that come with it? Because most innovations in business come from people lower down the line. I spent a lot of time in China, 30 times during my time. And basically, they like the UK innovation. And that innovation largely comes from people who split off from big companies and want to pursue a different line. So we've provided a framework now to be in the R&D, to be part of what they're doing, but it's geared to me what we say is the new coming low carbon economy. And there are many examples of where that can happen. And business can ask in this, uh, universities and things to produce it. Government, this government particularly, I'm not saying it won't be different than us, they listen to business. And if business are backing it, you have a better chance of getting the project than you just ask it, because they'll judge whether you've got a mayor or not, because that's part of the problem now, right? But business can be the force for making change with governments who want to do really what business wants to do, and they're usually innovating ideas. And to be fair, the industry under, I don't know what his name is, the chairman, the uh, secretary of state um, for industry and business. Greg Clark. Greg Clark, they put a lot of money to I'm on to the way these. to see him this afternoon, John. Well, they see, he has put a lot of money into these different places to innovate and research. Yeah. And I was telling him money's available. Our bid of 50 million is to that department. Yeah. They, and they are in their mind that the future is this. You need to be in the area where they are and proposing things that will perhaps not make a major carbon change like energy, but just a smart one on some new innovation and development. And you with business, need, business, you need to have from them what do they think they need. It may be a business interest. You convert it into a more regional one. And that powerhouse is a place like this and the combination and integration of decision makers on a common policy and everybody says it at the same time and shows the community wants it. Often these things get the bid that, um, if you look at Drax, they constantly went to government mm. and now they complain they can't get in the front door. And Drax is important. And yet Drax was an industry fed by coal. They cut down coal. We lose the coal contracts as well in the port area, right? So they go to timber and they bring now. Now they produced a machine to take, suck out the carbon of the air which is remarkable. So we're identifying that research, partly financed by industry and Drax, as the new feature of what the kind of industries are going to be, access to water in an industrial way. So we're finding out the things, but we're already getting the benefit from a joint cooperation of the resources to make the research in detail, because governments usually always want to look at the research we've done. Brilliant. On that note, I think um, I'll just... Uh, well, John, look, thank you. Really appreciate it. Apologies if there are any further questions. I think we, uh, to try and stick to time, now need to wrap things up. So, look, if I may, <clears throat> first of all, John, thank you. Thank you for your, for your time. And I'm delighted to hear that you are Scalmersdale's newest ambassador and newest friend. And we'll, we'll be, I promise you, we'll be picking up the, the challenge and the mantle you set and I, I'm sure, speak on behalf of the board, that we, we would love to take you up on your offer and come across to Hull and see what more lessons we can learn. I think, um, I, I did tell you earlier, this gentleman's, this gentleman's energy is unreal, and I appreciate we covered an awful lot of subjects. But for me, there are a few very, very, very key, key takes. Food for thought. First of all, you know, we covered a number of industries. The message I took was, look, look what's going on around you, see what the opportunities are, play at your strengths, and capitalize on them. And John, John you know, touched on many. If you look back, I'm, I'm sure you know, many people in this room could see the same opportunities on our doorstep. We have got an estuary. Of course, I have a, 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 a focus on the ports industry. But believe you me, when I talk about my industry, I talk about a plethora of those that are supported in and around it. And we're extremely well placed to capitalize on them. So look, I, I think, John, the challenge has been set. If I may just wrap up um, and, and say the following, really, I think what's become really clear and crucial for me this morning is the role that business can play in shaping its own future. It's really, really easy to sit here and moan about politicians. That's not hard at the moment, is it, John? Let's be really honest. It's not difficult at all, yeah? But actually, we do have a really loud voice. 
frustrates the hell out of me when this gentleman keeps talking about Jürgen over at Siemens. He's all right for a bloke on the East Coast, I guess. But, you know, we, we've, got, we've, got our own, we've got our own powerhouse here, John. I, I, I joke about it, but, you know, what, what Siemens have done in Hull is amazing. We've got our own versions here. Um, another Czech executive, a big company like you're doing uh, it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So I, I, it's my, one of my stupid sense of humour points there, John, clearly got lost. But uh, uh, yeah, my, my, my point really being is that when, when you look at what's been done in Hull, when you look at what's been done on the East Coast, I mean, I can tell you, just from a port's perspective, our biggest competitor is ABP on John's doorstep. We spend, one of my colleagues here is with us today, we spend a huge amount of time working with ABP. We are, we are you know, quite quite strong rivals, but we see the bigger picture. Let's get the framework right, let's get the connectivity right, and then let's compete for what comes out of it. And you know, to, to be fair, uh, and, and ironically, this is one of the key areas that John's working very closely with us. So for me, the key take of today is look, recognize what's going on around you, identify the opportunities, come together as business, get one message, one voice, don't just moan, put a bit of money and time where your mouth is, and I, and I hope that doesn't sound too crass, and make a difference. So on that point, you'd be amazed if I didn't say this to you today. I, I'd ask and leave you with the following thought, really. Um, Scammersdale ambassadors, yeah? If we're really going to be effective, we need more, more businesses to join us, yeah? I go back to what I said earlier on. I'd ask each and every one of you in here that, that are not members of the ambassadors to think about it. Clearly can't compel you. We'd still invite you along, still want you to be part of the journey. But, but we really need your voice and we need your influence. And I think if we have that and you get on the bus, I think we can make a real, real difference. And I promise you, I go back to my commitment earlier on, while I'm around, and you've got me for a little while longer, that I can assure you is that we will deliver a return on that ticket that you buy. You know, by joining the ambassadors, I promise you we'll deliver a return on it. And uh, as, as we've heard several times today, the power of the organisation, of, of the collective, is so much more influential than the odd one or two here and there. So on that note, I'll thank you for your time. Uh, be, uh, if, if, uh, if you're able to stop behind one or two, it'd be lovely to catch up and hear your feedback on this morning. I'm absolutely determined to ensure that you know, we have more of this type of events. The experience that this gentleman's got here is just not replicable yet. The number of things, there's a huge amount when you go away and reflect on it that is really relevant to us, really, really relevant to us. The challenge has been set. We now need just to work out how we're going to uh, exploit where we are. So on that note, thank you all for your time. Have a great day, and I'll see you soon. John, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.